the door. Commissioner, before uh, starting our closing address for this block of hearings, there are some final documents that we wish to tender. There are 11 documents in total. Those documents are firstly a letter dated 15 September 2017 from Westpac to APRA, which is WBC 300 That'll be Exhibit 1.189. A report for Westpac from PwC dated May 2017 as part of the APRA targeted review WBC 300 It'll be Exhibit 1.190. A memo dated 29 July 2017 to the Westpac Board Risk and Compliance Committee in respect of the APRA targeted review, uh, WBC 200 Exhibit 1.191. A memo dated 25 August 2017 to the Westpac Board regarding Mortgage Responsible Lending Update, WBC 200 Exhibit 1.192. A document entitled Attachment 1, Westpac Response to Targeted Review Findings, WBC 300 uh, Exhibit 1.193. An email entitled Westpac Targeted Review Report dated 25 May 2017, WBC 300 005 Exhibit 1.194. Uh, a spreadsheet entitled Information Requested by APRA in Attachment B, WBC 300 Exhibit 1.195. A letter dated 15 September 2017 from CBA to APRA, CBA 0517 0002 0001. Exhibit 1.196. A PwC report for CBA as part of the APRA targeted review dated May 2017, CBA 0517 0002 0082. Exhibit 1.197. The Code of Practice of the Mortgage and Finance Association of Australia, RCD 0021 0001 0292. Exhibit 1.198 and the current version of the Banking Code of Practice, RCD 0021 0001 0174. Exhibit 1.199. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Commissioner, over the last two weeks, the Commission has received evidence of misconduct and conduct falling below community standards and expectations by a number of financial services entities the misconduct and conduct that has fallen below community standards and expectations has occurred in respect of the consumer credit products that we identified in our opening address, home loans, car loans, credit cards and overdraft facilities. It has also occurred in the selling of insurance with credit products and through a variety of account administration and processing errors made by financial services entities in connection with credit products such as home loans. In this closing address, we will deal with the case studies that have been the subject of evidence in turn. Uh, we will identify the findings that council assisting regard as open on the evidence, which we will invite the entity involved to respond to in written submissions. The findings will be articulated by reference, by reference to the Commission's terms of reference. For each case study, we will also identify more general questions that arise from the case study. Any party with leave to appear in these hearings will be permitted to lodge written submissions addressing these questions. Before turning to the case studies, we wish to make some further comments in relation to the responses of two entities to the letters written by you, Commissioner, in December last year and January this year, asking them to identify this, their misconduct and their conduct that has fallen below community standards and expectations. 
In our opening address, we referred to the fact that shortly prior to the commencement of the hearings, Westpac had informed the Commission that the information it had provided in response to those letters did not take account of some categories of data, so that further acknowledgements of misconduct would need to be provided. During these hearings, Westpac has provided further information to the Commission and more is yet to be provided. The additional material received to date demonstrates, for example, at least 55 instances of Westpac staff either falsifying or accepting falsified supporting documentation in connection with home and personal loan applications. A number of instances of Westpac staff receiving payments from referrers for the referral of customers to Westpac for loans and at least 25 instances where the Financial Ombudsman Service found or Westpac conceded that a customer who obtained a Westpac car loan should not have been approved for the loan as it was unsuitable for the customer. We also made observations in the opening address about the adequacy of the approach taken by CBA in its responses. We referred to CBA's first submission as adopting a high level and general approach and observed that CBA's second submission contained a large volume of spreadsheets that did not enable us to assess the type or scale of CBA's misconduct. Earlier today, CBA provided the Commission with further material. We have had limited time to review this additional material. However, we observe that the material refers to, for example, at least 41 significant events, of which seven involve responsible lending issues relating to home and personal loans, credit cards and overdraft facilities. Remediation totalling $5.326 million has been paid to customers in respect of these events, but remediation for at least two of the events is yet to be quantified. One event also resulted in payment of $180,000 in penalties to ASIC. There are, a further there are a further 13 events that involve processing errors, including in relation to credit cards, term deposits and overdrafts. Remediation totalling $99.45 million has been paid to customers in respect of these events. With remediation for one event, which involved a failure to apply a waiver of annual credit card fees, totalling $77.4 million. For four of these events, remediation has either not yet started or the remediation analysis is still underway. One such event involves misconduct that was identified in February 2015. At least three events involve consumer credit insurance, with remediation paid to customers for these three events totalling $26.12 million. The additional material also identifies at least 469 events that are described by CBA in this material as low rated. Of these, CBA has described 18.98% as involving incorrect fees, interest or repayment, and 11.51% as involving responsible lending issues. In relation to Aussie home loans and using Aussie home loans own classification of conduct, the additional material provided by CBA refers, for example, to 29 events involving brokers submitting false or misleading information and documents to lenders or providing misleading information to customers in four instances, the brokers involved were convicted of criminal offences. The same four brokers who were the subject of the evidence in the Aussie Home Loans case study in these hearings. There are references to 19 events involving breaches of the National Credit Act, including incidents where brokers did not make reasonable inquiries or verify the financial situation of customers <coughs> and there are references to 134 events involving either a breach of a broker or franchise agreement or a breach of policy.
we turn Commissioner to the case studies. We commence with the first case study examined in these hearings, which involved conduct in connection with the NAB Introducer Program. Two witnesses from NAB gave evidence in this case study. Mr Anthony Waldron, the Executive General Manager for Broker Partnerships, and Mr Angus Gilfillan, the Executive General Manager Consumer Lending in the Customer Products and Services Division. The Commission heard evidence that established that NAB bankers in the Greater Western Sydney area, in other parts of New South Wales, in the ACT and Victoria, engaged in misconduct in connection with home loan applications submitted through the NAB Introducer Program between 2013 and 2016. As a result of this misconduct, 10 bankers were dismissed, 10 are no longer with NAB, and 32 had internal consequences applied, such as reduction of their remuneration. A number of the bankers involved in the misconduct, including a number of those who were dismissed, were branch managers. The evidence establishes that NAB bankers engaged in conduct such as falsifying documentation in connection with home loan applications, knowingly accepting falsified documentation in connection with home loan applications, receiving payments from introducers, failing to disclose personal relationships with introducers, failing to meet face to face with customers, accepting home loan application and supporting documentation from introducers rather than directly from the customer, and approving home loans in circumstances where the customer did not have the capacity to service the loan and where the loan was therefore unsuitable for the customer. The NAB Introducer Program was and is a program by which third parties receive a commission payment for referring loan applications to NAB. Most loans referred to NAB by introducers are home loans. The commission was and is calculated as a percentage of the loan amount and paid to the introducer when the customer's loan application is approved and drawn down. Commission payments to certain introducers involved in the misconduct totaled approximately $630,000 over four years, of which $488,000 was paid to a single introducer. NAB's internal policies during the period of the misconduct required introducers to submit minimum volumes of home loan applications. The evidence establishes that the NAB Introducer Program has been a very profitable source of lending for NAB, resulting in over $24 billion in loans during the three-year period from 2013 to 2016. At its peak, there were approximately 8,000 introducers in the program. As at the end of October 2015, the four introducers involved in the misconduct had provided $139.782 million of loans drawn down to NAB. By February 2016, NAB had identified 90 customers with $50 million in loans obtained in connection with the misconduct of NAB bankers and introducers, in respect of which NAB had concerns about the customer's ability to service those loans on an ongoing basis. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to make the following findings of misconduct. First, NAB breached its statutory obligations under section 47 subsection 1 subparagraph A of the National Credit Act and section 912 capital A subsection 1 subparagraph A of the Corporations Act to do all things necessary to ensure that its credit activities and the financial services covered by its Australian Financial Services Licence were engaged in efficiently, honestly and fairly. Second, NAB breached its statutory obligations under section 47 subsection 1 subparagraph B of the National Credit Act and section 912 capital A subsection 1 subparagraph AA of the Corporations Act 
to have in place adequate arrangements to ensure that NAB's clients were not disadvantaged by any conflict of interest that may arise wholly or partly in relation to NAB's credit activities or in its provision of financial services. Third, NAB breached its statutory obligations under section 47, subsection 1, subparagraph G of the National Credit Act and section 912, capital A, subsection 1, subparagraph F of the Corporations Act to ensure that its representatives were adequately trained to engage in the credit activities authorised by NAB's credit licence and the financial services covered by NAB's Australian Financial Services Licence. Fourth, NAB breached the prohibition in section 128, subparagraph A of the National Credit Act on entering into home loans with consumers in circumstances where it had not made reasonable inquiries about the consumer's financial situations as required by section 130, subsection 1, subparagraph B of that Act. Fifth, NAB breached the prohibition uh, in section 128, subparagraph A of the National Credit Act on entering into home loans with consumers in circumstances where it had not taken reasonable steps to verify their financial situations as required by section 130, subsection 1, subparagraph C of that Act. Sixth, NAB breached the prohibition in section 133, subsection 1 of the National Credit Act on entering into home loans with consumers in circumstances where those home loans were unsuitable for the consumer. Seventh, NAB breached its obligation under section 912D, subsection 1 of the Corporations Act to provide a written report to ASIC in respect of the misconduct identified in 2015 in Greater Western Sydney, which breached a number of the general obligations imposed on NAB as a financial services licensee by section 912 capital A of the Corporations Act within 10 days after becoming aware of the breach. The evidence established that a written report to ASIC was not made until 2 February 2016 in circumstances where the misconduct breached firstly the obligation to do all things necessary to ensure that the financial services covered by the licence were provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. Secondly, the obligation to have in place adequate arrangements for the management of conflicts of interest that might arise in relation to the activities of the licensee in the provision of financial services. Third, the obligation to ensure that NAB's representatives were adequately trained to provide financial services. And fourth, the obligation to have adequate risk management systems. The eighth form of misconduct that we say is open on the evidence is a finding that NAB engaged in misleading and deceptive conduct. The ninth finding that we say is available on the evidence is a finding that NAB engaged in unconscionable conduct. Tenth, we say that NAB failed to comply with the expectations of ASIC in relation to responsible lending as set out in Regulatory Guide 209, Credit Licensing, Responsible Lending Conduct, which constitutes a recognised and widely accepted benchmark for meeting the responsible lending obligations in the National Credit Act. Eleventh. NAB failed to comply with the expectations of ASIC in relation to breach reporting by Australian Financial Services licensees as set out in Regulatory Guide 78, breach reporting by AFS licensees, which again constitutes a recognised and widely accepted benchmark, this time for meeting the breach reporting obligations in section 912 capital D of the Corporations Act. Twelfth. Well, is it the fact that those two regula uh, regulatory guides uh, are expectations of ASIC or simply that they are 
uh, either uh, accurate uh, summations of the law's requirements and or uh, they are widely accepted commercial benchmarks. Mm. We put it, Commissioner, on the basis that they constitute recognised and widely accepted benchmarks within the industry for meeting certain legal obligations imposed by the National Credit Act and the Corporations Act. And Commissioner, the Commissioner will recall that the definition of misconduct extends uh, uh, oh, yes. to, to those matters. Yes, yes. So in addition to the strict legal breaches of the legislation, uh, we put to you, Commissioner, that there is another form of misconduct that is also open to fine based on the failure to comply uh, with those benchmarks as published by ASIC. Yeah, paragraph D of the definition of yes. misconduct. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> Twelfth, NAB failed to comply with the Banking Code of Practice, which is the banking industry's customer charter on best banking practice standards and is therefore, we say, another recognised and widely accepted benchmark for banking practice. In particular, NAB failed to comply with the obligation in Clause 3.2 of the Code to act fairly and reasonably towards its customers in a consistent and ethical manner. And secondly, the obligation in Clause 27 of the Code to exercise the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker in selecting and applying credit assessment methods and forming an opinion about the customer's ability to repay home loans. Those are the findings of misconduct that we say are available in relation to NAB's conduct in the NAB case study. Uh, on the evidence, we say it is also open, Commissioner, to make findings that NAB engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. First, the evidence establishes that despite being aware uh, that it had identified approximately 1,300 customers who may have been affected by the misconduct uh, uh, that occurred in the period from 2013 to 2016, to date, approximately 71% of these customers have been contacted by NAB and no customer has yet been offered any remediation. Second, the evidence establishes that NAB was aware of potential misconduct in connection with the Introducer Program in Greater Western Sydney since at least April 2015, but did not commence a formal investigation until late October 2015, following two whistleblower disclosures. The Commission's terms of reference require the Commission to consider whether any findings of misconduct are attributable to the particular culture or governance practices of the financial services entity or result from other practices of the entity, including risk management, recruitment and remuneration practices. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that there were a number of causes of this misconduct which are attributable to the culture and governance practices at NAB, as well as its risk management, recruitment and remuneration practices. First, it's open to the Commissioner to find that a significant cause of the misconduct was NAB's remuneration and incentive scheme, which rewarded bankers for the volume of sales of home loans. The evidence establishes that from as early as April 2015, NAB was aware that one of the potential root causes for the misconduct was the star sales incentive program that the relevant bankers were all operating under, which rewarded bankers with bonuses for achieving certain targets for the sale of home loans. The investigation of the misconduct confirmed that the incentive program was a significant contributor to the misconduct. Although NAB has since moved many of its employees to a different incentive plan, the short-term incentive plan, that program continues to reward bankers with bonuses for achieving targets for the sale of home loans. 
The evidence also establishes that although NAB had a code of conduct, a breach of that code of conduct did not necessarily result in withholding of the employee's bonus. Instead, certain breaches of the code of conduct, which resulted in an amber conduct gate being applied, led to a reduction in the quantum of the bonus by 25%. In the words used in one of the project winnow documents produced by NAB to the Royal Commission, the risk and reward equation for bankers was unbalanced in favour of sales over keeping customers and the bank safe. Second, it's open to the Commissioner to find that another cause of the misconduct was the inadequacy of NAB's policies and processes for the recruitment and training of bankers. One of the key findings of the root cause analysis conducted by NAB was that their approach to recruitment, training and accreditation of bankers had not been fully effective in ensuring that all bankers understood consumer lending process compliance requirements. Third, it is open to the Commissioner to find that another cause of the misconduct was the inadequacy of NAB's policies for the recruitment and monitoring of introducers. NAB used introducers from a variety of business backgrounds which were unconnected with financial, property or legal services, such as gymnasiums and tailors. KPG made a series of findings in relation to the inadequacy of NAB's monitoring of introducers. KPMG? I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, yes. Yes. Yes, it was KPMG. Yes. KPMG brought in uh, yes. as part you said of the... KPG. Oh, I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, KPMG made a series of findings uh, noting that NAB bankers did not clearly understand the rules in relation to introducers. Fourth, it's open to the Commissioner to find that another cause of the misconduct was the inadequacy of NAB's processes for managing conflicts of interest. Fifth, it's open to the Commissioner to find that a cause of the misconduct was the inadequacy of NAB's policies for the prevention and detection of fraud by bankers and introducers. Another of the key findings of the root cause analysis conducted by NAB was that overall control effectiveness to prevent fraud events was inadequate because it was reliant on bankers doing the right thing. Sixth, it is open to the Commissioner to find that a cause of the misconduct was the inadequacy of NAB's policies and procedures to ensure that its bankers were engaging in responsible lending. Mr Waldron agreed that gaps in the end-to-end -end loan application process were exploited by bankers and NAB itself raised the question as to whether the end-to-end -end mortgage origination fulfilment, ongoing management and eventual repayment required fundamental review from a controls effectiveness perspective. The Commission's terms of reference also require the Commission to consider whether the, the mechanisms for redress for consumers of financial services entities who suffer detriment as a result of misconduct by financial services entities are effective. Just before we come to redress and go yes. back to culture and governance practices. Yes. Um, it occurs to me that I may have to consider whether there is a disconnect between the formal limitations on the so-called spot and refer model, which are uh, that the introducer may say uh, to the customer no more than NAB's a bank that lends money, can I give you, uh, can I give your name and contact details to the bank? And all it can say to the bank is the name and contact details of the customer are such and such, the customer may want a loan. When there is a disconnect between those formal requirements and the likely uh, conduct of introducers in the real world. <coughs> Just 
strikes me as a very unusual conversation that, uh, to use the expression we've heard so often, it'd be an unusual conversation with the client. All I can tell you is NAB's a bank. It lends money. As we've seen from the Evidence Commissioner, that was not the way many of the interactions with introducers, customers and NAB occurred. I had moved, Commissioner, to effectiveness redress. of mechanisms for redress for uh, consumer detriment. And we say that the evidence supports a finding that NAB has not effectively and adequately responded to the detriment suffered by its customers as a result of the misconduct. In particular, as we have already noted, NAB has identified approximately 1,300 customers who may have been affected by the misconduct during the period from 2013 to 2016, but none has yet been offered any remediation. The number of customers who have experienced hardship as a result of the misconduct is unknown. The evidence gave rise to concerns about whether the resources allocated within NAB to the customer response work stream were adequate. NAB is invited to make written submissions addressing each of the findings that we have identified as being open to the Commissioner as well as any other findings that it regards as available on the evidence. All parties with leave to appear will be permitted to provide written submissions addressing the following questions which arise from the NAB case study. First, do remuneration and incentive policies that reward bank employees for volume of sales of loans create an unacceptable risk that bank employees will prioritise the sales of loan products over First, the bank's responsible lending obligations. Second, the bank's statutory obligation to provide loans to customers in a manner that is efficient, honest and fair. Third, the bank's statutory obligation to have adequate arrangements to ensure that customers are not disadvantaged by any conflict of interest that may arise. Fourth, the bank's obligation to ensure that the conduct of its employees in connection with the provision of loans is not misleading, deceptive or unconscionable. The second question is whether introducer programs create an unacceptable risk that banks will breach, first, their responsible lending obligations, second, their statutory obligation to provide loans to customers in a manner that is efficient, fair and honest. Third, their statutory obligation to have adequate arrangements to ensure that customers are not disadvantaged by conflicts of interest. And fourth, their obligation to ensure again that the conduct of their employees in connection with the provision of loans is not misleading, deceptive or unconscionable. The third question is do banks have adequate policies to deter and if necessary detect fraud by employees and third parties such as introducers in connection with loan applications? The fourth question is do banks have adequate policies to address customer detriment occasioned by misconduct of bankers or third parties such as introducers in connection with home loans and in a timely fashion. Fifth, how do financial services licensees ensure that they comply with the obligation in section 912 capital D of the Corporations Act to make a written report to ASIC of any significant breach of the obligations within section 912 capital A of the Corporations Act within 10 days. Sixth, is the practice by banks of defaulting to use of the HEM benchmark when a customer declares living expenses that are less than the HEM benchmark consistent with the statutory requirement to take reasonable steps to verify a customer's financial situation 
before entering into a home loan with that customer. Commissioner will recall that the evidence from NAB included the evidence from Mr Gilfillan, which dealt with the use of the HEM benchmark by NAB. The seventh question, which also arises from the evidence of Mr Gilfillan, is do banks too readily permit waivers of their policies in connection with the assessment of home loan applications including policies in relation to the assessment of serviceability of the loan. We note the evidence of Mr Gilfillan that policy waivers occur at NAB on a daily basis and that they are made on approximately 15% of home loan files. We also note the findings of Ernst & Young in 2017 that in some channels up to 55% of NAB home loan files that were reviewed involved policy waivers. We turn, Commissioner, to the second case study examined in these hearings, which involved consideration of CBA's arrangements with mortgage brokers and head groups. The Commission heard evidence in this case study from a mortgage broker, Mr Mark Harris, and from the Executive General Manager for Home Buying at CBA, Mr Daniel Huggins. The Commission heard evidence that home loan applications are submitted to CBA through two channels, the proprietary channel and the third party distribution channel. The proprietary channel refers to loans offered through CBA's employees or authorised representatives, as well as through CBA's referral source program. It represents approximately 59% of CBA's home loan portfolio. The third party distribution channel refers to loans submitted to CBA by brokers and represents approximately 41% of CBA's home loan portfolio. The home loan applications submitted to CBA through the third party distribution <coughs> channel come to CBA through mortgage aggregators or mortgage franchises, which CBA and others in the industry refer to as head groups. Head groups have their own Australian credit licence and contractual arrangements with brokers. By contrast, no formal contractual arrangement exists between CBA and the brokers who submit loans to CBA. The Commission heard evidence that CBA requires those brokers who wish to submit home loan applications to it to go through an accreditation process. As part of this accreditation process, CBA brokers currently complete an authority to act form in which they acknowledge that to maintain accreditation with CBA, they need to submit a minimum of four home loan applications and settle a minimum of three home loans in a six month period. Mr Huggins gave evidence that CBA had not been systematically enforcing this requirement. The evidence establishes that CBA regards its accredited brokers as acting as its agent when dealing with customers and expects those brokers to promote its products. The Commission also heard evidence about the ways in which CBA remunerates head groups for loans submitted by CBA accredited brokers. CBA pays head groups upfront commission and trail commission for each home loan that is draw drawn down, the quantum of which is tied to the size and duration of the loan. Upfront commission is paid when the loan is funded, while trail commission is paid during the life of the loan, calculated by reference to the net balance of the home loan account at the end of each month. Head groups pass on a portion of these commissions to the brokers. CBA's contractual arrangements with head groups give CBA a number of rights and entitlements in its dealings with head groups, a number of which Mr Huggins told the Commission CBA currently chooses or will choose not to enforce. CBA's contractual entitlements include a right to alter the Commission structure if the average monthly settlements for the head group in respect of CBA loans for the previous year falls below $5 million. 
Pursuant to the contractual entitlements, CBA pays bonuses to head groups if certain performance targets are met, as well as payments to assist with training, development and compliance, which are dependent contractually on the head group meeting certain volume requirements for loans drawn down. Head groups are also remunerated for sales of non-home loan CBA branded products provided to home loan customers, such as insurance products, via CBA's Connect Referral Program. Such payments may also be passed on to brokers. CBA also gives non-financial benefits, commonly tickets to hospitality events or sporting events, to brokers directly the value of which is now limited to an amount of $350 <coughs> per person per event. Until recently, CBA segmented its accredited brokers into tiers based on volume thresholds, with brokers in the highest tier, the diamond tier, receiving the best service offering by CBA, primarily in the turnaround time for loan application processing. Mr Huggins conceded that CBA had recognised that this structure could create a conflict of interest and said that CBA was in the process of transitioning to a two-tier segmentation system by which accredited brokers would be classified as either essential or elite on the basis of the application of quality and complementary metrics so that brokers could reach elite status for reasons other than the volume of loans submitted and drawn down. It emerged during the evidence that CBA's CEO holds the view that upfront and trailing commissions for mortgage brokers can lead to poor customer outcomes. A letter dated 10 February 2017 from Mr Ian Narev to Mr Stephen Sedgwick the independent reviewer for the B Retail Banking Remuneration Review was tendered. In that letter, Mr Narev acknowledged on behalf of CBA that the use of loan size linked with upfront and trailing commissions for third parties can potentially lead to poor customer outcomes. Mr Narev expressed the view that, and I quote, mortgages also sit outside the financial advice framework even though buying a home and taking out a mortgage is one of the most important financial decisions an Australian consumer will make. We would support elevated controls and measures on incentives related to mortgages that are consistent with their importance and the nature of the guidance that is provided. For example, the delinking of incentives from the value of the loan across the industry and the potential extension of regulations such as future of financial advice to mortgages in retail banking. Mr Huggins acknowledged that there is a conflict in a broker commission structure which is linked to the size and length of the loan, so that the larger the loan and the longer the period over which it extends, the larger the commission payable to the broker. Mr Huggins acknowledged as did his CEO, that this can lead to a conflict between the customer's interests and the broker's interests, since the broker can maximise their income by getting the largest loan possible approved, extending over the longest period of time. The issues paper submitted to Mr Sedgwick with Mr Nareb's letter recorded that CBA has found its broker loans to have higher total debt to income levels higher loan to value ratios and higher interest costs compared to loans that originate in its proprietary channel. CBA told Mr Sedgwick that these findings were consistent with the hypothesis that differences in remuneration between the proprietary, proprietary channel and the broker channel were driving different customer outcomes and lent support to the case for discontinuing volume-based commissions to brokers. The paper referred to a move to a flat fee payment as a potential solution to these problems. Despite CBA's views and findings on these matters, CBA has not stopped paying volume-based commissions to brokers, nor has it taken any steps to commence ceasing that practice. 
Mr Huggins gave evidence that if CBA were to change its practices, customers might move to competitor lenders, which would have a material impact on CBA's business. He also expressed concerns about the impact of such changes on the viability of the mortgage broking industry. The Commission heard evidence that CBA does not inform customers of the amount of commission which will be paid to the head group or broker in respect of a customer's loan. A customer receives a credit contract schedule that records any commission amount as not ascertainable. Mr Huggins' evidence was that the amount of upfront commission, the rate of trailing commission and any amount paid under the Connect referral program are each known and are each able to be disclosed by CBA to the customer at the time the loan is entered into. But CBA makes no such disclosures. The Commission also heard evidence about the program that CBA conducted in 2017 by which 710 accredited CBA brokers had their accreditation revoked by CBA on the basis of inactivity. The Commission heard that CBA originally intended to re revoke the accreditation of approximately 3,000 further brokers, but that it ultimately did not proceed with this plan. Mr Huggins' evidence was that CBA had identified a group of less active or inactive brokers that were potentially associated with less desirable customer outcomes. He said that the aim of the deaccreditation program was to improve the overall quality of the brokers accredited by CBA. However, Mr Huggins conceded that in hindsight, it would have been better if CBA had not deaccredited brokers purely based on volume, but had instead required inactive brokers to undergo more training in order to ensure the quality of their work. Mr Mark Harris, a mortgage broker, gave evidence that he was accredited by CBA until 20 February 2017, at which time his accreditation was revoked by CBA with immediate effect. Mr Harris was told by CBA that his accreditation was revoked on the basis of inactivity. Mr Harris's evidence was that as a result of the rec revocation of his accreditation, he is now unable to submit home loan applications to CBA on behalf of a customer. His evidence was that if he had a customer for whom he thought a CBA loan would be a good fit, he would now need to refer the customer to another broker if they wished to apply for that loan. The evidence shows that CBA is presently introducing new accreditation standards for brokers. Mr Huggins' evidence was that these standards will be focused on monitoring quality and delinking volume requirements from accreditation. The Commission also heard evidence of CBA's activities in relation to broker oversight. In August 2017, the Group Audit and Assurance Internal Audit for which Mr Huggins was accountable, found that CBA was not doing enough to monitor the activities of the head groups and the mortgage brokers who sit under those head groups. The audit report noted that it is not industry practice for banks to complete assurance in respect of aggregators and that CBA was reliant on brokers to confirm the product offered to the customer was not unsuitable. The report found that while CBA has various contractual rights to monitor head groups, it has not exercised those rights. The report listed large numbers of different types of compliance issues by brokers who had submitted home loans to CBA. On this evidence, we submit that it is open to the Commissioner to make the following findings of misconduct against CBA. First, CBA's remuneration arrangements with brokers and head groups breach its statutory obligations under section 47 subsection 1 subparagraph B of the National Credit Act and section 912 capital A subsection 1 subparagraph AA of the Corporations Act to have in place adequate arrangements to ensure that customers of CBA whose home loans are submitted by a mortgage broker 
are not disadvantaged by any conflict of interest that may arise wholly or partly in relation to CBA's credit activities or in its provision of financial services. Second, CBA's failure to adequately monitor the activities of its head groups breaches its statutory obligations under section 47, subsection 1, subparagraph A of the National Credit Act and section 912, capital A, subsection 1, subparagraph A of the Corporations Act to do all things necessary to ensure that the financial services covered by its financial services licence and the credit activities authorised by its credit licence are engaged in efficiently, honestly and fairly. Third, CBA's failure to disclose to customers the commissions paid to head groups in respect of their loan breaches its statutory obligations under section 47, subsection 1, subparagraph A of the National Credit Act and section 912, capital A, subsection 1, subparagraph A of the Corporations Act to do all things necessary to ensure that the financial services covered by its financial services licence and the credit activities authorised by its credit licence are engaged in efficiently, honestly and fairly. Fourth. Just before you leave, three. Yes. Uh, there may be two elements to that. I can't now recall. But it may be that the failure, if there is one, uh, would be uh, whether there was any commission payable because I have a recollection which is subject to correction when I look back at the transcript and evidence that all that was said was a conditional statement. Commission yeah, may be charged. And then there's this question of not ascertainable. Yes, the, the, the Commissioner's right. There were two separate documents. Uh, the um, consumer credit schedule, which had been in place for some time, was the document that uh, recorded not ascertainable next to the word commission. Uh, the second document, which was introduced in December 2017, which was said to um, uh, improve the situation is the document that um, we would say uh, lessened the certainty in a consumer's mind about what was going on because it made the payment of a condition seem like a possibility rather than a certainty and there was certainly no reference to the quantum of any commission payable in that document. And that leads on not only to Consideration of 47 and 912A, but also misleading and deceptive, I would have yes, thought. Yes, it does. It yes. does, Your Honour. Yes. Um, now, the, the fourth form of misconduct, I won't deal with misleading and deceptive conduct because um, the Commissioner has already raised that, but the fourth um, form that we uh, submit is open to you, Commissioner, uh, is a finding that CBA's remuneration arrangements with brokers and head groups, as well as its failure to disclose commissions to customers, breach the banking code of practice. In particular, we submit that they breach the obligation in clause 3.2 of the code to act fairly and reasonably towards the customer in a consistent and ethical manner. On the evidence, it is also open to the Commissioner to make findings that CBA engaged in conduct that fell below community standards and expectations. First, despite taking the position that volume-based commissions paid to brokers are potentially associated with poor customer outcomes, CBA has failed to remove such commissions or take steps to remove the conflict of interest created by these commissions a conflict between the broker's interest in maximising upfront and trail commissions earned from the loans they submit and the customer's interest in obtaining a loan that meets their needs. Second, by revoking the accreditation of hundreds of mortgage brokers on the basis of inactivity with immediate effect and without first providing brokers with an opportunity to satisfy CBA of the quality of their activities, CBA paid insufficient regard to the interests of brokers in being able to recommend a full suite of potentially suitable loan products to a customer. All parties with leave to appear 
will be permitted to provide written submissions addressing <coughs> the following questions which arise from this CBA case study. First, does the use of upfront and trailing commissions for remuneration of head groups and the brokers who submit loans through head groups lead to poor customer outcomes? Second, should upfront and trailing commissions be replaced with an upfront flat fee payment? Third, is the first mover issue identified in CBA's evidence a genuine commercial impediment to change in respect of the structure of broker remuneration? If so, what can and should be done to overcome that impediment? Fourth, will the program of reforms in the mortgage broking industry announced by the Combined Industry Forum in 2017 ameliorate the conflicts of interest or any other issues that have been referred to in this case study? We turn to the third case I, study. I'd also be assisted, I suspect, by submissions from parties generally about what's a deceptively simple set of questions to ask. Who does a mortgage broker act for? You can put it in three ways, I think, and the, the issue has at least three elements to it. Who does the broker act for? That might be seen as a, an inquiry about fact or fact and law. Two, who does the customer think the broker is acting for? And third, who does the lender think the broker is acting for? And do you give uh, separate answers at separate steps along the way? If you do, what are the markers that tell you I've gone from a step where this set of answers is appropriate into the next stage where that set of answers is appropriate. So who does a broker act for? Who does the customer think the broker acts for? Who does the lender think the broker acts for? Are there varying or varied answers at various steps? If there are, what are they? sort of question that invites uh, you have three hours in which to answer it. You may commence writing now, I think. Uh, and don't forget to put the number at the head of each page. Do go on, Ms Orr. Commissioner, I was turning to the third case study examined in these hearings, which involved misconduct by four former Aussie Home Loans brokers, Mr Shiv Sahay, Ms Emma Khalil, Mr Mad Van Nair and Mr Bernard Meehan during the period from 2011 to 2015. <coughs> the Commission heard evidence in this case study from Ms Linda Harris, the General Manager People and Culture at AHL Investments Proprietary Limited, and Mr Giles Boddy, the Chief Financial Officer at AHL Investments Proprietary Limited. A witness statement was also tendered from Mr David Smith, the General Manager of Strategy and Products at AHL Investments Proprietary Limited. The evidence established that the misconduct of the four former brokers included the falsification of documents submitted to lenders in support of home loan applications, such as bank statements, pay slips and letters of employment. The loans submitted to lenders by each of these brokers gave rise to a loan book with Aussie Home Loans receiving upfront and trail commission payments from lenders in respect of each of the loans in the loan book. A portion of these commission payments was passed through to the broker and the re remainder was retained by Aussie Home Loans. The size of the portion Aussie Home Loans passed through to the broker was determined by Aussie Home Loans by reference to the total settled loan amounts. The higher the value of the settled loan amounts, the higher the percentage of the upfront commission passed through to the broker. Aussie Home Loans brokers had a contractual obligation to introduce a minimum number of loans per month. 
The evidence established that Aussie Home Loans did not detect the misconduct engaged in by three of the four brokers, each of whom had been with Aussie Home Loans for a number of years, despite obvious anomalies in the supporting documentation that those brokers were submitting to lenders. In each of those instances, Aussie Home Loans was notified of the misconduct by a lender who had detected it. In each of these instances, Aussie Home Loans terminated its relationship with the broker. In each of these instances, one or more of the lenders had told Aussie Home Loans that they had, or intended to, revoke their own accreditation of the broker, and Aussie Home Loans terminated their relationship with the broker on this basis. In each of the three instances where the misconduct was detected by a lender, Aussie Home Loans was reliant on one or more lenders to conduct a review of the broker's files and investigate the misconduct. The misconduct of the fourth broker, Mr Meehan, was detected by Aussie Home Loans as part of a file review process it undertook in respect of brokers who were submitting more than 50% of their loans to one lender. The selection of Mr Meehan's files for review was also informed by the fact that the lender to whom Mr Meehan was submitting more than 50% of his loans was Westpac, which Aussie Home Loans knew accepted a letter of employment to verify income, a document that could be easily falsified. Aussie Home Loans did not report the misconduct of any of the four brokers to the police nor did Aussie Home Loans report the misconduct of three of the four brokers to ASIC. Instead, it submitted a standard form to ASIC, notifying ASIC that the brokers had ceased as credit representatives of Aussie Home Loans. As part of ASIC's investigation into Mr Sahay, which resulted from not notification by a person or entity other than Aussie Home Loans, Aussie Home Loans subsequently told ASIC that it had terminated its relationship with Ms Khalil and Mr Nair on the basis that they were suspected of fraudulent misconduct. Each of the four brokers was ultimately charged with criminal offences as a result of their misconduct. Aussie Home Loans also did not report the misconduct of three of the four brokers to the Mortgage and Finance Association of Australia despite the evidence that it was obliged to do so as a member of that association itself, and the evidence that it required each of its brokers to be members of that association because the association had powers to expel a broker for misconduct. Aussie Home Loans did not notify the customers of any of the four brokers of the basis on which it had terminated its relationship with the broker. It transferred the broker's customers to another home loans, Aussie Home Loans broker. Following the termination of its relationship with Mr Sahay, Aussie Home Loans was contacted by two of Mr Sahay's customers, both of whom were in a situation of distress as a result of Mr Sahay's misconduct. Aussie Home Loans chose not to advise either customer of the basis on which Mr Sahay's relationship with Aussie had been terminated. Following the termination of its relationship with Mr Nair, Aussie Home Loans made an ex gratia payment to a customer who had engaged solicitors and complained about the misconduct of Mr Nair. Aussie Home Loans was unable to explain the basis for this ex gratia payment, the sum of the ex gratia payment or provide any other details about it. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to make the following findings of misconduct against Aussie Home Loans. First, Aussie Home Loans breached its statutory obligation under Section 47.1a of the National Credit Act to do all things necessary to ensure that its credit activities were engaged in efficiently, honestly and fairly. Second, Aussie Home Loans breached its obligation under Section 47.1b of the National Credit Act to have in place adequate arrangements to ensure that Aussie Home Loans clients were not disadvantaged by any conflict of interest that may arise uh, in relation to Aussie Home Loans credit activities. 
One such conflict of interest was the conflict between the broker's contractual obligation to introduce a minimum volume of loans per month and the broker's contractual obligation to comply with the law, including the responsible lending obligations. Third, Aussie Home Loans breached its statutory obligation under Section 47.1c of the National Credit Act to take reasonable steps to ensure that its representatives complied with the National Credit Act. Fourth, Aussie Home Loans breached its obligation under Section 47, subsection 1, subparagraph L, Roman numeral 2, to have adequate risk management systems. Aussie Home Loans risk management systems did not adequately prevent, detect or respond to the fraud. They did not create clear accountabilities for risk or prioritise ownership of risk, and they did not require reports to be made to law enforcement authorities, regulators or disciplinary bodies. They did not require lenders whose loans were potentially affected by the fraudulent conduct to be notified of the nature of the fraudulent conduct or even that there was fraudulent conduct. Where the lender had detected the fraud, Aussie Home Loans relied on the lender to investigate and respond to the fraud. Aussie Home Loans did not require current or former customers to be notified of incidents of fraud or the potential impact of such incidents on their home loans and on their ability to service their home loans. Fifth, Aussie Home Loans breached the obligation in section 117, subsection 1, subparagraph A of the National Credit Act to take reasonable steps to verify the financial situation of customers prior to making an assessment of whether the home loans for which it assisted customers to apply would be unsuitable for the customers. Sixth, Aussie Home Loans, through its representatives, engaged in conduct involving lenders and conduct involving customers that was misleading, deceptive and unconscionable. Seventh, Aussie Home Loans, through its representatives, failed to comply with the expectations of ASIC in relation to responsible lending as set out in Regulatory Guide 209, which as we've already submitted, constitute a recognised and widely accepted benchmark for meeting the responsible lending obligations. Eighth, Aussie Home Loans breached the obligations imposed on it by the Code of Practice of the Mortgage and Finance Association of Australia. Under that Code of Practice, Aussie Home Loans was obliged to comply with all applicable laws, to act with appropriate care, skill and diligence, to not engage in any acts or omissions of a dishonest or fraudulent nature, to suggest or recommend to customers only credit that Aussie Home Loans reasonably believed was appropriate to the needs of the customer after undertaking an appropriate assessment of the customer's capacity to service the proposed credit, to keep customers informed of all relevant information known to Aussie Home Loans relating to current credit applications on the basis that the fact that a broker had been terminated for reasons connected with allegations of fraud related to any current credit applications of that broker. On the evidence, it's also open to the Commissioner to make findings of conduct by Aussie Home Loans that fell below community standards and expectations. First, Aussie Home Loans failed to advise customers whose loans had been submitted by one of the four brokers and which had been approved of the termination of their relationships with the brokers and the reasons for the termination of those relationships. <coughs> Second, Aussie Home Loans prioritised the retention of its trailing commissions from the broker's home loan book over investigating and dealing with the conduct that had led to the termination of the broker or ensuring that such conduct had not led to any detriment for a customer. Third, Aussie Home Loans lodged annual compliance certificates under Section 53 of the National Credit Act in 2014 and 2015 
that certified that Aussie Home Loans had adequate arrangements and systems in place to ensure that it did all things necessary to ensure credit activities authorised by its licence were engaged in honestly and fairly, adequate arrangements and systems in place to ensure that its customers were not disadvantaged by conflicts of interest, adequate, adequate arrangements and systems in place to ensure that its representatives complied with the National Credit Act, and adequate risk management systems in circumstances where it was aware that a number of its brokers had in the years covered by these certificates engaged in fraudulent conduct, much of which had not been detected by Aussie Home Loans. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to find that the misconduct arose not merely because of rogue conduct by individual brokers, but because the systems, processes and culture at Aussie Home Loans permitted such misconduct to occur. We note the following matters in particular. The remuneration of Aussie Home Loans brokers was tied directly to the number and size of home loans introduced by the broker. Therefore, the more loans the broker introduced and the higher their value, the greater the commissions that would be paid. This resulted in a culture within Aussie Home Loans that prioritised selling of home loans over the proper assessment of the customer's requirements and objectives for the purpose of identifying and recommending a loan product that was not unsuitable for the customer. The systems for prevention and detection <coughs> of fraud, as already noted, were inadequate. Whilst Aussie Home Loans was aware that certain lenders accepted supporting documentation for a loan application that was capable of being easily falsified, they did not implement systems that proactively and routinely identified brokers who were potentially taking advantage of the more lax verification requirements of these lenders by submitting falsified documents. The systems for ensuring that the recommendations made by Aussie Home Loans brokers complied with Aussie's general conduct obligations and responsible lending obligations under the National Credit Act were inadequate. We note also the evidence that in an internal audit of Aussie Home Loans that was the subject of a report in December last year, it was concluded that the Aussie Home Loans control environment was unsatisfactory and that management awareness and actions required improvement. We note the views expressed to the CBA Audit Committee in February of this year that CBA's oversight of Aussie Home Loans needed to strengthen and the risk culture at Aussie Home Loans needed to lift. As to the effectiveness of the mechanisms for redress, for Aussie Home Loans customers who suffered detriment as a result of the misconduct of the four former brokers, it is open to the Commissioner to find that Aussie Home Loans did not effectively and adequately respond to the potential detriment suffered by customers. Aussie Home Loans is unable to say how many of the customers of the four brokers were affected by their fraudulent conduct. It is not known whether, and if so, how many, customers obtained loans through the conduct of one of the four brokers that were unsuitable loans and which therefore should not have been approved, nor how many of those customers are now in arrears on those loans. It is also open on the evidence to find that Aussie Home Loans did not effectively and adequately respond to the danger posed to other future customers of the four brokers. By failing to report the details of their misconduct to law enforcement authorities, regulators, professional, professional dis disciplinary bodies, or to lenders engaging with the broker, Aussie Home Loans failed to take adequate steps to ensure those with powers to impose consequences on the brokers were put in a position where they could exercise those powers. Aussie Home Loans is invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings that we have identified as open, as well as any other findings that it regards as available on the evidence. 
All parties with leave to appear will be permitted to provide written submissions addressing the following questions, which arise from the Aussie Home Loans case study. First, do remuneration structures that reward mortgage brokers for volume of sales of loans create an unacceptable risk that mortgage brokers will prioritise the sales of loan products over their responsible lending obligations, their obligation to recommend loans to customers in a manner that is efficient, fair and honest, their obligation to have adequate arrangements in place to ensure that customers are not disadvantaged by conflicts of interest, and their obligation to ensure uh, that the conduct uh, of the brokers is not misleading, deceptive or unconscionable. Second, do credit licensees whose representatives engage in mortgage broking activities have adequate systems and processes to prevent fraud, to detect fraud, to respond to fraud and to identify and address any detriment to current and former customers occasioned by the fraudulent conduct of its representatives. We turn to the fourth case study examined in these hearings. There may also be a general question, I think, about ACL holders, about uh, whether uh, those who hold ACLs as distinct from AFSLs should be made subject to a system broadly similar to the 912A plus 912D uh, reporting obligations of Part 7 of the the Section 912D obligation. Of the Corporations yes. Act. Uh, now, there are no doubt issues that people will say arise about 912A, 912D. Uh, some may say that they are issues that uh, require reconsideration of the whole structure of those provisions. I don't know. But uh, should ACL holders be subject to broadly similar requirements or is there some reason why ACL holders should uh, be subject to differing reporting obligations from those that apply to AFSL holders? <coughs> we turn to the fourth case study, Commissioner, which examined ANZL, ANZ's responsible lending practices in connection with home loans. The Commission heard evidence in this case study from Mr Robert Regan, a consumer who had entered into a home loan with ANZ, and from Mr William Rankin, the lead of the homeowners team at ANZ. The evidence established that Mr Rankin is responsible for ANZ's home loan portfolio, which is worth approximately $265 billion. In FY 2017, ANZ had approximately 1.008 million home loan accounts on offer, a majority of which originated through the broker distribution channel. In the period from 1 October 2016 to 30 September 2017, ANZ sold over $67 billion of home loans and of that amount, almost $38 billion came from the broker channel. The Commission heard evidence about ANZ's policies and procedures for dealing with home loan applications submitted by brokers. The evidence establishes that ANZ relies heavily on brokers to make inquiries into a customer's financial situation. The results of the broker's inquiries about the customer's financial position are provided to ANZ in a document referred to as a Statement of Financial Position which is signed by both the customer and the broker. The evidence establishes that ANZ does not take any steps to verify the customer's general living expenses as declared on this form. The evidence also establishes that where ANZ holds information about a customer that is inconsistent with information about the customer's expenses as recorded on this form, it disregards that other information and does not make any further inquiries into that inconsistency. In the words of Mr Rankin, ANZ's processes in this situation are to do nothing. 
Mr Rankin's evidence was that it would be highly complex, very time consuming, very costly and ultimately not necessarily that helpful to undertake a manual review of paper-based bank statements in order to verify a customer's statement of financial position. When asked about the requirement to take positive steps under ASIC Regulatory Guide 209, which sets out ASIC's expectations in relation to responsible lending obligations, Mr Rankin accepted that there was a customer benefit trade-off when considering how strictly Regulatory Guide 209 was to be complied with. Another theme of Mr Rankin's evidence related to ANZ's use of the HEM benchmark. Mr Rankin initially suggested that some indirect verification of a customer's living expenses took place by way of comparing the customer's declared living expenses with the income adjusted HEM benchmark and using the higher of the two. However, Mr Rankin sub subsequently accepted that the primary purpose of undertaking that comparison was to assess the customer's capacity to service the loan, not to verify the customer's financial situation. As at April 2017, in 73% of ANZ's home loan files reviewed by KPMG in the course of the APRA targeted review process, the customer's living expenses had defaulted to the HEM benchmark. The evidence establishes that approximately the same percentage of ANZ files would currently default to the HEM benchmark. Mr Rankin gave evidence about the application of ANZ's processes to Mr Robert Regan's application for a home loan from ANZ. Mr Regan was a 72-year-old pensioner who sought and obtained a $50,000 home loan from ANZ in March last year in order to obtain money he could send to individuals overseas. Mr Reagan subsequently learnt that the individuals were part of a scam. The loan was secured against his unencumbered home and the application for the loan was submitted by a mortgage broker. At the time of making the loan application, Mr Regan's income was approximately $1,229 per fortnight. Mr Regan provided the broker with bank statements evidencing his income and expenditure. The bank statements showed that Mr Regan had spent significant amounts of money on the scam in the previous month. Mr Regan did not discuss his expenses with the broker but understood that the broker would calculate his expenses from his bank statements. The bank statements reflected on their face multiple Western Union money transactions <coughs> by which Mr Regan sent thousands of dollars to people involved in the scam. The statement of financial position prepared by the broker and signed by both the broker and Mr Regan recorded Mr Regan's monthly expenses as $1,140, approximately half their true value. The statement of financial position was submitted to ANZ by the broker, along with supporting documentation that included Mr Regan's bank statements and a Centrelink statement from the previous year recording the receipt of pension. In assessing Mr Regan's home loan application, an ANZ assessment officer considered Mr Regan's exit strategy on the loan, which was considered to be that he could downsize if required and pay out the loan. No such exit strategy was discussed with Mr Regan. Mr Regan's age was also not considered as part of the assessment of the home loan application, other than a reference to uh, consideration of only the untaxed component of his superannuation payment because he is aged. ANZ granted the home loan to Mr Regan for a 30-year term. Mr Regan drew down on the loan and lost the money in payments to the individuals involved in the scam. From early on, Mr Regan found it difficult to make his loan repayments. He sought assistance from ANZ, who completed a hardship application form on his behalf, but completed it incorrectly. Had the form been completed correctly, it would have shown that Mr Regan did not have sufficient money to make his monthly repayments. 
However, ANZ rejected Mr Regan's application for hardship assistance on the basis of the incorrectly completed form. Mr Regan continued to seek hardship assistance from ANZ, communicating with ANZ through a financial counsellor and a community legal centre. The day before Mr Regan gave evidence in the Royal Commission, ANZ offered to reverse all fees and interest applied to Mr Regan's home loan since drawdown, stop the accrual of future fees and interest and apply a goodwill credit of $1,500 to the balance. Mr Regan gave evidence that he intended to reject the offer. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to make the following findings of misconduct against ANZ in relation to the home loan it entered into with Mr Regan. First, ANZ breached its obligations under section 47 1A of the National Credit Act and section 912 capital A 1A of the Corporations Act to do all things necessary to ensure that its credit activities in relation to Mr Regan and the financial services provided to Mr Regan covered by its financial services licence were engaged in efficiently, honestly and fairly. Second, ANZ breached the prohibition in section 128 subparagraph A of the National Credit Act on entering into a home loan with Mr Regan in circumstances where it had not made reasonable inquiries about Mr Regan's financial situation as required by section 130 subsection 1 subparagraph B of that Act. Fourth, uh, I'm sorry, third, ANZ also breached the prohibition in section 128 subparagraph A of the National Credit Act on entering into a home loan with Mr Regan in circumstances where it had not taken reasonable steps to verify his financial situation as required by section 130 subsection 1 subparagraph C. Fourth, ANZ breached the prohibition in section 133 subsection 1 of the National Credit Act on entering into a home loan with Mr Regan in circumstances where that home loan was unsuitable for Mr Regan. Fifth, ANZ failed to comply uh, with Regulatory Guide 209, which as we've already submitted, constituted a recognised and widely accepted benchmark for meeting the responsible lending obligations. Sixth, ANZ failed to comply with the Banking Code of Practice. In particular, it failed to comply with the obligation in Clause 3.2 of the Code to act fairly and reasonably towards Mr Regan in a consistent and ethical manner, and the obligation in Clause 27 of the Code to exercise the care and skill of a diligent and prudent banker in selecting and applying credit assessment methods and forming an opinion about Mr Regan's ability to repay the home loan. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to make a finding that ANZ's conduct in relation to Mr Regan also fell below community standards and expectations. First, ANZ completed the hardship application form incorrectly, which resulted in Mr Regan being denied hardship assistance in circumstances where he ought to have been granted such assistance. Second, having subsequently received information that established that Mr Regan was suffering hardship, ANZ failed to make an offer of hardship assistance to Mr Regan in a timely fashion. No offer was made until the day before Mr Regan gave evidence before the Commission. Third, the offer of hardship assistance made by ANZ to Mr Regan the day before he gave evidence is inadequate and does not adequately address the hardship that Mr Regan is experiencing as a result of being provided with an unsuitable loan. It is also open to the Commissioner to make a finding that ANZ's conduct more generally in connection with the assessment of home loan applications falls below community standards and expectations because in verifying the declared living expenses of a customer and in assessing a customer's ability to service a home loan, it relies on the HEM benchmark, a conservative measure of expenditure. But whether that constitutes verification is itself a separate issue. I think you've already a identified. A misconduct issue. It's a conduct issue. Yes. yes. So that, that 
gave rise to a suggestion, Commissioner, that there be a finding of misconduct for uh, breaching 128 subparagraph A of the National third Credit of your, Act. Third of your conduct. Uh, that's finding. right. Yeah. Entering into the loan in circumstances where it hadn't taken reasonable <clears throat> steps to verify. It's open to the Commission to find that the misconduct of ANZ in connection with Mr Regan's home loan application can be attributed to a culture of being willing to undertake, in the words of Mr Rankin, a customer benefit trade-off in relation to responsible lending obligations. Such a culture may favour administrative convenience over strict adherence to the law. It is also open to the Commissioner to find that ANZ's policies and procedures relating to broker-initiated home loans are inadequate as they do not provide a system for ANZ to take reasonable steps to verify a consumer's financial situation insofar as that verification relates to a customer's general living expenses. In relation to the effectiveness of mechanisms of re for redress for, for customers who have before, suffered again, detriment... Before you come to that, is there anything to be made? Again, my memory of the evidence may be imperfect, but I thought that... Uh, Mr Regan uh, drew the bulk of the funds or drew uh, part of the funds uh, at the bank uh, in the form of a draft payable to uh, London. Yes, that's so. And uh, dealt with the person who had uh, uh, signed the mortgage documents uh, on behalf of the bank. Yes. The and that person, uh, uh, at least as far as Mr Regan's evidence went, uh, made no remark on the fact that the drawdown was for payment in uh, GBP rather than payment in AUD for, what was it, the stated basis on the uh, broker uh, completed loan form, renovations, renovations. and extensions or something? Yes. Yes. yes, that was the evidence, Commissioner, uh, and the evidence of Mr Regan was that no questions were asked when he asked for an international transfer for uh, a significant component of the funds. Uh, yes. And, Commissioner, that, that does seem to be another basis for a finding of conduct that falls below community standards and expectations. Yes, possibly even a conduct finding. I don't know. These are things I'm going to have to think about and ANZ are going to have to tell me their views about. But I must say the evidence was a little striking. Yes. I, I was moving, Commissioner, to effectiveness of mechanisms for redress. redress. And we submit, Commissioner, that... Uh, the evidence uh, renders it open to you to make a finding that ANZ's mechanisms for redress have been inadequate to address the detriment suffered by Mr Regan as a result of being provided with an unsuitable loan. This is apparent, we say, both from ANZ's conduct in relation to the failed hardship application and from the nature of the offer and the timing of the offer made to Mr Regan on the 15th of March this year. ANZ is invited to provide written submissions addressing each of the findings that we have indicated we regard as open, as well as any other findings it regards as available on the evidence. All parties with leave to appear will be permitted to provide written submissions addressing the following questions, which arise from the ANZ case study. First, do credit providers have adequate policies to, that, to ensure that they comply with their obligations under the National Credit Act when offering broker-originated home loans to customers, insofar as those policies require them to make reasonable inquiries about the consumer's requirements and objectives in relation to the credit contract, to make reasonable inquiries about the consumer's financial situation, and to take reasonable steps to verify the consumer's financial situation. Second, is use of the HEM benchmark an appropriate way to deal with the difficulties associated with securing an accurate assessment of living expenses from a customer? Third, is use of the HEM benchmark appropriate in assessing whether a loan is unsuitable 
for a customer. Fourth, is the HEM benchmark too conservative a measure of a customer's living expenses? And fifth, does the widely known use of the HEM benchmark as a default for customers' living expenses create an unacceptable risk that brokers will fail to make reasonable inquiries about a customer's financial situation, instead opting to declare an amount of living expenses for the customer that is known by the broker to be in the vicinity of the relevant HEM benchmark? Now, it may be that the general issues in this area might go a little further, um, at least as far as the evidence reveals, HEM seems uh, as close to universal as uh, uh, may be uh, as the uh, benchmark. First is the use of any benchmark suitable. HEM, Henderson Poverty, uh, a newly devised benchmark is the use of any benchmark suitable. Second is a related issue. Uh, in light of the evidence that's been given I think by a number of witnesses, that by and large customers are poor historians when it comes to identifying their uh, outgoings. Uh, people are not very good at uh, providing the information, uh, not for want of trying, uh, and not for want of prompting, just by and large, people are poor historians. What does that say, if anything, about judging home loans uh, on a measure of uh, UMI? Uh, I think one of the targeted review reports, we now have all four all five, don't all we? All four. All four. There is another entity who's, uh, I did not tender, who is not part of these hearings. There, there are four targeted review reports in, and one of them, I think, uh, referred to the fact that home lending in other sophisticated systems uh, does not uh, operate by reference to UMI. Now, those are very large questions, uh, and it may be that... Uh, uh, they are questions that uh, are ultimately better treated uh, much later in the course of the Commission's work. I don't know. But uh, those who are preparing submissions about HEM and its use, I think, need to be on notice that uh, there may be questions of the kind uh, that I have mentioned which are then provoked by uh, whatever conclusions I get to uh, about him. That is, those preparing the submissions should not take the identification of questions you have made, which is important, uh, as uh, the entire universe uh, of debate in this field. It may be that you answer those questions and answering those takes you into a rather larger uh, universe and the scope of it is most conveniently indicated by the fact that other systems uh, work out home lending uh, by systems other than uh, surplus monthly income, UMI. <coughs> Yes. 
Uh, we turn then, Commissioner, to the fifth case study examined in these hearings, which involved two add-on insurance policies sold by CBA to customers who did not meet the employment eligibility criteria to claim certain benefits under the policies. The two products were Credit Card Plus Insurance and Loan Protection Product Insurance. The latter product, in fact, comprised two separate sub-products, the Personal Loan Protection Product and the Home Loan Protection Product. Both <coughs> Credit Card Plus Insurance and the Loan Protection Product have been sold by CBA since at least 2003. The Commission heard evidence in this case study from Ms Irene Savidis, a customer who had purchased Credit Card Plus Insurance, and from Mr Clive Van Horen, the Executive General Manager for <coughs> Retail Products within the Retail Banking Services Business Unit of CBA. We deal first with the evidence about the Credit Card Plus Insurance product. <coughs> Customers are offered this insurance product as part of their application for a CBA branded credit card. During the period from 2011 to 2015, 29.5% of CBA branded credit cards had a Credit Card Plus insurance policy attached to them. In April 2015, as a result of an internal audit, CBA determined that approximately 65,000 customers who had purchased Credit Card Plus insurance may not have been eligible to claim benefits under the policy in the event that they suffered temporary or permanent disability or involuntary unemployment as they were not employed when they were sold the policy. Whilst a customer was provided with a copy of the product disclosure statement for the policy, CBA staff had not been required to inform the customer that such benefits could not be claimed if they remained unemployed. This was despite the fact that ASIC had produced a report in 2011 containing a number of recommendations in relation to the sale of consumer credit insurance including a recommendation that sales scripts include an explanation of the main exclusions under the policy. Mr Van Horen referred to CBA's reliance upon the disclosures in the product disclosure statement and the failure to refer to exclusions in the sales scripts as a flawed assumption and a flawed judgment. In around May 2015, CBA amended its sales scripts to introduce a knockout question to prevent the sale of Credit Card Plus insurance to people who didn't meet the employment eligibility criteria. Changes were also made to the form used for online sales of credit cards, but these changes did not introduce a knockout question. No such question was introduced into the online form until two years later, in 2017. Also in May 2015, CBA made a good governance notification to ASIC of the Credit Card Plus issue. The notification substantially underestimated the number of customers affected by the problem and CBA now accepts that it should have made a significant breach notification under section 912D of the Corporations Act in respect of the incident. Extensive correspondence between ASIC and CBA followed, which involved negotiations over more than a year about whether CBA would remediate any customers who had been sold Credit Card Plus insurance when they were unemployed, and if so, how it would remediate them. After being pressed by ASIC, CBA changed its position on remediation a number of times. Initially, it did not offer to remediate customers. It then offered to only remediate customers with open policies. It ultimately agreed to remediate customers with both open and closed policies. Similarly, CBA moved from a position of only refunding part of the premiums paid to refunding the entirety of the premiums, at least to students. In addition, Aspects of the remediation program required customers to proactively opt in in circumstances where CBA knew that the likely rate of uptake by consumers was low. Customers who purchase Credit Card Plus insurance in circumstances where they did not meet the employment eligibility criterion 
paid $11 million in premiums and received half a million dollars in response to claims made. CBA expects that at the conclusion of the remediation program, it will have remediated approximately 64,000 customers who will be refunded amounts that total approximately $10 million. We turn to CBA's sale of the loan protection product. Customers are offered this product as part of their application for either a CBA home loan or a CBA personal loan. During the period from 2011 to 2017, 42.64 per cent of CBA personal loans had an associated personal loan protection policy and 10.34 per cent of CBA home loans had an associated home loan protection policy. <coughs> the exclusions from the LPP product were similar but not identical to the exclusions from the Credit Card Plus insurance product. Only customers who met the employment eligibility criterion could claim loan repayment cover in the event of disability or involuntary unemployment. As it had done in May 2015 for Credit Card Plus insurance, in October 2015, CBA introduced a knockout question for its assisted channels, which meant that an application for LPP insurance would not proceed if the employment eligibility criterion was not met, at least in relation to the home loan protection product. An equivalent question was not introduced into the digital online application form again until almost two years later, in June 2017. Although CBA knew that there was a problem with the loan protection product insurance being sold to people who did not meet the employment eligibility criterion from at least October 2015, CBA did not report that issue to ASIC or take any steps to identify how many customers were affected by the issue. Instead, CBA made a decision, in the words of Mr Van Horen, to sort out Credit Card Plus insurance first and then move on to the other insurance product. CBA decided, again in the words of Mr Van Horen, to prioritise the Credit Card Plus insurance matter on an assumption which proved to be mistaken that the scale of the issues in relation to the loan protection product would be less than for the Credit Card Plus insurance product. Approximately two years after CBA changed its sales scripts for the loan protection product to introduce a knockout question, when CBA said it was preparing to notify ASIC of the issue with that product, ASIC raised the issue with CBA as a result of a customer complaint about being sold loan protection product when the customer did not meet the employment eligibility criterion. That customer complaint had resulted in an ex gratia payment from CBA. The quantum of the ex gratia payment and the circumstances of that payment are not known. At ASIC's request, CBA thereafter made a significant breach notification under Section 912 capital D of the Corporations Act in October 2017, about two years after the sales scripts had been changed. In that notification, CBA and Colonial Mutual accepted that they had breached the efficiently, honestly and fairly obligation being a condition of their financial services licence. As things have transpired, CBA's estimate is that the loan protection product issue has affected a far greater number of customers than the Credit Card Plus insurance issue. As at 5 March this year, CBA estimated that it would be communicating with approximately 140,000 customers in relation to the loan protection product issue. In its initial submission to this commission, dated 29 January 2018, CBA had told the Commission that it had identified only 20,000 customers eligible for refunds. Shortly prior to the commencement of these hearings, CBA decided to cease selling CCP insurance and to stop selling the personal loan protection stream of the loan protection product. Mr Van Horen accepted 
that CBA made this decision at least in part because the products would not be economically viable after the implement implementation of a deferred sales model which was expected to extend from credit card sales to personal loan sales. CBA intends to continue to sell the home loan protection stream of the loan protection product, which is the most profitable of each of the products. On the evidence, it is open to the Commissioner to make the following findings of misconduct against CBA and against its wholly owned subsidiary, Colonial Mutual, which issued the policies. First, CBA and Cominsure, uh, Colonial Mutual, breached their statutory obligations under section 912 capital A 1A of the Corporations Act to do all things necessary to ensure that the financial services covered by its licence were provided efficiently, honestly and fairly. Second, CBA and Cominsure breached their obligations under section 912D of the Corporations Act to provide a written report to ASIC when they realised that Credit Card Plus Insurance and Loan Protection Product Insurance had been sold to customers who did not meet the employment eligibility criterion on the basis that that was a breach of the efficient, honestly and fairly obligation. The obligation to report that breach arose within 10 days after becoming aware of the issues in 2015. Third, CBA failed to comply with the Banking Code of Practice. In particular, CBA failed to comply with the obligation in Clause 3.2 of the Code <coughs> to act fairly and reasonably towards its customers, <coughs> excuse me, in a consistent and ethical manner. On the evidence, it's also open to the Commissioner to make findings of conduct by CBA that fell below community standards and expectations. Is it open to me to find there was misleading and deceptive conduct? Selling a product to someone uh, <clears throat> in the circumstances uh, they are not eligible to claim uh, a significant benefit available under the product? The I doubt CBA will say an answer is to be found in the product disclosure yes. statement. Yeah. Um, is there an issue whether that's a complete answer? Yes, there is, Commissioner, but that is the issue that we identified, uh, that deep within the product disclosure statement, the customer would find these exclusions. Uh, ASIC had, as I indicated, made recommendations about the importance with these particular types of products of highlighting for the customer the exclusions, and that was not done. Well, I'd, I'll need to go back and read Ms Savita's evidence quite closely in this respect. And therefore, what I'm about to say is not intended as an accurate representation of her evidence. Uh, but. Someone says to a customer, you need this to help you uh, if you hit hard times. It'll help you pay off your debt or it'll, if you die or you're totally and permanently disabled, it'll give you a moratorium or it'll pay the minimum payments, whatever the uh, benefit was, uh, if you're out of work for a few months. I would have thought there's a issue there, whether there's not M and D. Certainly in the case of Ms Savitas, we think that there is, Commissioner, because the evidence given by Ms Savitas about the conversation that she had with the person in the branch, uh, in which she was told that it was good for her and that despite the fact that she was unemployed, it would be useful in some way for her to have the product, that, we say, is evidence that yields a potential finding of misleading and deceptive conduct. A rather more general issue, which is not, uh, I think, on the table yet, but which it's useful to flag, is you have all this detailed regulation. We inevitably and necessarily get down into the weeds of the particular provisions and we uh, look at whether this paragraph of this provision applies or not. But lying behind them, there are some 
very general norms of conduct. And uh, a general norm of conduct uh, often worth close examination is uh, a corporation shall not in trade or commerce engage in conduct that is misleading or deceptive or is likely to mislead or deceive. And that's, reflect, that's replicated in ASIC Act and uh, many other acts. But that high level, don't mislead or deceive your customers, uh, is a uh, often enough important point of entry uh, into consideration of issues. We would say that another norm of conduct that sits behind this and is relevant to this is the norm of conduct reflected in the clause of the Banking Code of Practice that I read out, which is the requirement to act fairly and reasonably towards customers in a consistent and ethical manner. And of course, statutorily, there's the honest, efficient, fair yes. uh, provision. And I rather suspect we could have a an hour or two debating uh, what the differences are, if any, yes. uh, that emerge from the differing formula, uh, formulae that are used. But bottom line is, be honest, be fair to your customers. One's a statutory obligation, the other's a obligation that's voluntarily assumed by membership of the, uh, or adoption of the relevant code. That's right. Yeah. Uh, we were moving, Commissioner, to findings... Oh, you were rudely interrupted. <laughs> you were moving to... We were moving, Commissioner, to findings that we say are open on the basis that CBA's conduct fell below community standards and expectations. We say first that having become aware that Credit Card Plus insurance was being sold to customers who didn't meet the employment eligibility criterion, CBA failed to introduce a knockout question to the online credit card application form to prevent the sale of the product online to people who didn't meet the employment eligibility criterion. Uh, it took almost two years before this occurred. In addition, having become aware that the loan protection product was also being sold to customers who didn't meet the employment eligibility criterion in 2015, CBA again failed to introduce a knockout question to the online form to prevent the sale of the product, again for approximately two years. Second, having become aware that the loan protection product was being sold to people who didn't meet the employment eligibility criterion in 2015, not only did CBA fail to comply with its obligation to make a significant breach report to ASIC under section 912D, but it failed to notify ASIC of the problem in any way until ASIC approached CBA with a customer complaint approximately two years later. So we draw a distinction there between the good governance notification that occurred in relation to the Credit Card Plus product and the lack of any notification in relation to the loan protection product. Third, CBA took over a year to agree to implement a remediation program that was acceptable to ASIC in order to compensate customers who had been sold Credit Card Plus insurance when they didn't meet the employment eligibility criterion. Fourth, the sales scripts that CBA requires its staff members to use when selling these products in assisted channels explicitly, Commissioner may recall, explicitly invite CBA's staff members to attempt to overcome the customer's objections up to two times during the entire application. That again is conduct that we say falls below community standards and expectations. Can I just embroider a little the remediation yes. community standards and expectations? Is anything to be made of the fact that there seems to be repeated steps in the negotiation? Not only does it take a long time, but there seem to be a number of steps along the way. 
Yes, the incremental nature of the negotiations and the fact that CBA moved a small amount, then another small amount, then another small amount, adds, we say, to the conduct falling below community standards and expectations, particularly bearing in mind that the position from which CBA started was to offer no form of remediation to any customer. Well, the question includes, is there a community standard and expectation that confronted with an issue like this, a financial services entity will uh, front up and accept it uh, pretty promptly and then set about fixing it pretty promptly. Now that's a pretty broad axe description uh, and I'm sure that uh, those who are interested in these matters, obviously particularly Commonwealth Bank, but perhaps uh, other entities more generally would say that a much finer blade needs to be taken to the issue than the broad acts I've just described. But uh, the, the basic question is, does the community expect financial service entities uh, who are faced with allegations of uh, uh, inappropriate conduct, in effect, to uh, face up to it, accept it, fix it quickly. In our submission, the community expects financial services entities in these situations to firstly fix the problem, secondly, compensate the customer for any detriment caused to the customer as a result of the problem, and thirdly, to do so in a timely fashion. Yes. <clears throat> Much more elegant than my broad axe, Ms. Orr. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> uh, we say, Commissioner, that on the evidence, it's open to find that, the C that CBA's misconduct in connection with the sale of the credit card plus insurance and loan protection product insurance can be attributed to a culture and processes within CBA mm that permitted such misconduct to occur. In particular, we note that CBA's processes required its staff members to attempt to sell Credit Card Plus insurance as part of the credit card application process and to attempt to sell loan protection product as part of the application process for a home loan or a personal loan. CBA processes did not require its staff members to highlight the major exclusions of the two types of policy, despite the recommendations of ASIC that CBA do so approximately two years earlier. <coughs> In our submission, it's open to the Commissioner to find that CBA did not effectively and adequately respond to the potential detriment suffered by customers who were sold these products in circumstances where they didn't meet the eligibility criterion. CBA was not proactive in the approach that it took to remediating customers who suffered detriment. And as we have already discussed, Commissioner, CBA's negotiations with ASIC about remediation were protracted and involved ASIC pressing CBA a number of times to extend the scope and reconsider the form of any proposed remediation program. In relation to customers who suffered detriment as a result of the sale of the loan protection product, CBA elected not to attempt to identify them or address the detriment they had suffered until the issues with the Credit Card Plus insurance product had been resolved some two years later. Mr Van Horen accepted that this was, at least in part, based on an assumption that CBA could compensate those customers at a later point in time? Well, the premise seemed to be that CBA could cope with one thing at a time, not two things. I'd be interested in CBA's submission about that. The questions that we pose, Commissioner, for written submissions by any party with leave to appear that arise from this case study are as follows. First, are the processes that financial services licensees have in place for the sale of add-on insurance 
sufficient to ensure that those entities comply with their obligations under section 912A1A of the Corporations Act, the obligation to do all things necessary to ensure efficiently, honestly and fairly. Second, are existing legal mechanisms considered in light of the regulatory changes which are anticipated to come into effect under the deferred sales model sufficient to address the issues associated with the sale of add-on insurance to customers identified by ASIC in its report 256. Third, how do financial, licenses, financial services licensees ensure, this is a question we posed in another case study as well, that they comply with their obligation under section 912D of the Corporations Act in relation to reporting significant breaches. Commissioner, I see that we're already yes, past sir. four o'clock and in anticipation, I'm sorry. Can I just, while we're talking about general issues uh, arising out of add-on insurance, yes. uh, other parties might also be good enough to address a question which can be framed at its most general as what am I to make of the fact that CBA has chosen to withdraw from this uh, or from large parts of this market? Am I to make of that that CBA has made a particular commercial judgment which is uh, distinctive uh, to uh, CBA or am I to make of that anything uh, about uh, whether other entities can or should be looking at uh, their continued participation uh, in that market. That is, uh, do other entities want to be heard to say, look, what CBA has done is a matter wholly for CBA, it's absolutely irrelevant to what we do, or is it uh, an observation that CBA has got out of large parts of this market that uh, I might take to account in deciding whether other financial entities could, should, might uh, look carefully at either participating at all or participating only in certain ways or participating only with certain uh, uh, particular ring fences around them. Now, you're pointing to the time. Uh, Ms. Orr, we've still got how many uh, case studies to go. Still have the last few days of case studies to go, Commissioner, but in anticipation of potentially running out of time, we have prepared uh, our submissions, our closing submissions in relation to those case studies in writing, and we would be happy to make those submissions available to the parties. Right, so long as the parties don't run away with the idea that somehow uh, these last few days are to be treated as uh, sort of B grade, second class, uh, less important uh, than uh, those matters you've addressed orally. Uh, the fact that we resort to writing simply uh, might tell you a deal about my stamina, Ms. Orr. Uh, so what arrangements can we make to get copies of the balance of the subs. We, we can upload the written submissions to the court book, to the online court book immediately. Right, so the so parties can get access to them to them before close of business tonight. Yes, Commissioner. So the timetable set can stay yes, in cement. Yes. Uh, there we are. Well, um, thank you very much, Ms. Orr, uh, for your submissions. I'm sorry that uh, my stamina uh, should uh, prove to be finite. Uh, I suspect stamina of all in the room may have proved to be finite. Um, may I thank all who have participated in round one uh, in uh, the various respects uh, for their contributions to it. Uh, as I ha have announced earlier, uh, round two of hearings is planned to commence on 16 April and uh, at least it is intended that uh, it should be conducted uh, in this courtroom uh, commencing on 16 April next. Uh, 
Uh, I'll adjourn the Commission until 16 April at 0945.